We've talked about the economic forces that led to the Industrial Revolution and some of the social consequences of that revolution. But we've left out one important part of the story, a part of the story very appropriate to consider as we celebrate Martin Luther King's birthday. And that is the role that slavery played in both the financing and supplying the Industrial Revolution. During the 18th century, sugar became enormously popular throughout Europe. Britain, for example, consumed five times as much sugar in 1770 as in 1710. By 1750, sugar imports made up a fifth of all European imports, and in the last decades of the century, four-fifths of the sugar came from the British and French colonies in the West Indies. That money from this trade was a major source of capital for the Industrial Revolution. The sugar was produced by slaves working in hellish conditions. So what does this chart tell you about Britain's economic stake in the slave trade? Well, next to Portugal, which was bringing slaves to its colonies in Brazil, England led the world in importing slaves, 2.6 million slaves in 12,000 horrible voyages from Africa to the New World, the notorious Middle Passage. And if you have any remaining doubt about whether this was good business, here is the average price of a slave with the price adjusted for inflation to today's dollars. In other words, human beings were a mighty valuable trade good. You've seen this chart before. The newly emerging cotton textile industry required huge quantities of cotton, more than 500 million pounds by 1849. Well, where and how would you guess that most of that cotton was produced? By the start of the American Civil War, the American South produced more than three quarters of England's cotton. Here you see cotton production before the invention of Eli Whitney's cotton gin and before uh, the expansion of a mechanized cotton industry. And here is cotton production on the eve of the American Civil War. This crop, so important to British industry, was also, of course, produced by slaves. So England had a huge economic stake in slavery, both the direct trade in human beings and in the two major slave-produced products, sugar and cotton. So based on this, what would you guess was the position of the British government and the British people on slavery? Okay, I tried to set you up to guess wrong. In fact, England abolished the slave trade even as it was booming, and it abolished slavery 26 years later 20 years before America's Emancipation Proclamation. So, why did this happen? I worry sometimes that we teach history with too much emphasis on big economic and geopolitical forces if it's predetermined by huge movements and that the acts of determined individuals don't make any difference. I don't think that's true. Now, you should already realize that the Industrial Revolution uh, was led by people with a great deal of individual ingenuity and enterprise. It made a difference that you had these kinds of inventors like James Watt. The end of the slave trade likewise had a lot to do with individual ingenuity and enterprise, and it also had a lot to do with Christian faith and individuals who were willing to put that faith into action. Uh, what you see here is the symbol of the British Anti-Slavery Association. It was designed and promoted by one of England's great industrialists, Josiah Wedgwood. Wedgwood was a young man from a poor family who made a fortune producing ceramic goods for the middle class. He devoted a chunk of that fortune to the abolition movement and uh, also this very famous symbol. But today I want to talk about three other men who de whose dedicated efforts helped end first the slave trade and then slavery in the British Empire. You're also going to watch clips from a movie about the struggle to abolish the slave trade, uh, a movie called Amazing Grace. So the first of our heroes is Alauda Equiano. Born in what is now Nigeria, 
Equiano was captured and sold into slavery as a boy of 11. Uh, one interesting note, just to provide some balance to the slave trade story, Equiano's own family actually owned slaves. Most of the slave trading in the interior of Africa was conducted by African them Africans themselves who raided enemy villages in a little industrial revolution. What goes around comes around. Uh, the main thing that slaves were traded for was cotton cloth, first from India and then from England. Anyway, Equiano was shipped to Barbados on the infamous Middle Passage, but was almost immediately sold to an English naval officer. Under this master who owned Equiano for the next seven years, Equiano moved to England, managed to get an education, and traveled the world on ships under Pascal's command. In 1766, uh, he earned enough money to buy his freedom, and eventually Equiano became an active abolitionist. In 1789, he published a widely read autobiography, The Interesting Narrative of the Life of Alauda Equiano. So let's watch a clip from Amazing Grace in which Alauda Equiano talks to William Wilberforce, who's actually the narrator about his experiences on the Middle Passage. Wilberforce became the leader of the group in Parliament attempting to abolish the slave trade. I'll tell you more about him in just a few minutes. Here is a diagram of a British slave trade, which was presented as evidence to a committee of the British Parliament investigating the slave trade in 1790 under William Wilberforce's leadership. Your first reading, by the way, is an excerpt from Alauda Equiano's autobiography describing the horrors of the Middle Passage. Our next hero is William Wilberforce. He was the son of a wealthy merchant and studied at Cambridge University, where he began a lasting friendship with the future Prime Minister, William Pitt the Younger. As a young man, Wilberforce had devoted his life to wine, women, and song. He was a party animal. In his late 20s, he experienced a profound religious conversion and became a devout evangelical Christian. His reignited Christian faith led him to become interested in social reform, particularly the improvements in factory conditions in Britain. And by the way, your last reading, uh, or one of your readings, is an excerpt from a book he wrote years later entitled Real Christianity, where he talks about what he sees as the social responsibility of Christians. At any rate, around the time of his conversion, Wilberforce met Equiano and the abolitionist Thomas Clarkson, both of whom were campaigning to end the British slave trade. Wilberforce became the leader of the anti-slave trade movement in Parliament, and for the next 18 years, he regularly introduced anti-slavery motions in Parliament. So let's continue with the video, which shows him introducing the first of these motions. You probably won't be able to make out the speech he gave. Uh, it really was, according to historical reports, drowned out by hecklers. But I've included the excerpt that got shouted down in your readings. The motion, by the way, failed overwhelmingly. And the video clip continues with a strategy meeting where Wilberforce lays out the plan that will, in the end, lead to the abolition of the slave trade and eventually slavery. So let's watch the next clip. Many historians consider Wilberforce's campaign the first great mass protest movement, and people still study it as an example of how to organize people to effect change. One abolitionist strategy was to organize a boycott of sugar produced by slaves. I just note that the success of this boycott was due almost entirely to women, many of whom became leaders in the abolitionist movement. So the next clip shows some of Wilberforce's organizing strategy. It opens with a party boat tour that was organized for leading citizens who'd supported members of parliament, uh, but they get a surprise when Wilberforce shows up uh, and gives them a glimpse and a sniff of a slave ship. So let's watch another clip. One of Wilberforce's mentors was John Newton. Newton had actually been the captain of a slave ship. On one voyage, his ship was caught in a violent storm. He prayed to God, asking uh, for deliverance, and when, in fact, both for himself and for the people on the ship, uh, and when he was, in fact, delivered, when he survived, he wrote a famous hymn, Amazing Grace. The melody, by the way, was thought to originate from a tune that slaves used to sing. <laughs> 
Newton also made a vow at the time to care for the slaves that he was transporting in a humane fashion. He did not actually quit slave trading right away, but eventually he abandoned the profession and became a leading Anglican minister. Years later, when he was very old, he finally published a memoir of his experiences with the slave trade. Really, it was a kind of confession. So in the next clip, we see John Newton talking with Wilberforce about how the memories of his slave trading days still haunted him. The book played a big role in building opposition to the slave trade and in winning support for Wilberforce's efforts. So for almost 20 years, Wilberforce fought unsuccessfully to pass a parliamentary motion abolishing the slave trade. Finally, the war with Napoleon gave Wilberforce the opportunity he needed. The French Revolution had actually abolished slavery, but Napoleon reintroduced slavery in the French colonies, so support of abolition was no longer seen as being a pro-French position, which had been one of the problems early on. Abolition also became an election issue in the parliamentary election of 1806, and since there was growing public uh, opposition to the slave trade, several new abolitionist supporters were elected to Parliament. Uh, you should know, by the way, that British elections were still limited to a very small number of people. This wasn't really a democratic election. And a lot of the support uh, for abolition of the slave trade came among the upper classes who could vote. And of course, it was just men who could vote, although women were active abolitionists. At any rate, on February 23rd, 1807, the abolition bill passed by a vote of 283 to 16. Uh, the picture you see is an actual drawing from the time, but I want you to watch one last clip of this historic moment. The person delivering the tribute to Wilberforce uh, was the British Foreign Secretary, Charles James Fox. Wilberforce died in July of 1833. A month later, the House of Lords passed the Slavery Abolition Act, which ended slavery in most of the British Empire. Nearly 800,000 African slaves won their freedom. The vast majority were in the Caribbean. I'd like to close with one last set of heroes. By the time the American Civil War started in 1861, Northern England was the workshop of the world, that's a quote, with 440,000 cotton workers spinning and weaving in 2,400 factories. England's main source of cotton was the Confederate States, as we noted earlier. 1.1 billion pounds a year were being shipped into Liverpool to be processed in the cotton factories of the region. So when the Union side in the American Civil War imposed a naval blockade on the South, in other words, preventing uh, ships from leaving the South with all that cotton, the main source of cotton for northern English factories dried up. Mills closed. Workers, despite charity efforts, went without food and heating. Many were evicted from their homes. The shipping and finance bosses in Liverpool openly sided with the Confederacy. And in fact, the Confederacy was counting on this support. Uh, they organized warships for the South, and they sent, sent uh, blockade-running merchant ships out from Liverpool. And now mill owners also began lobbying the British government to deploy the Royal Navy to break the Union blockade and maybe even to side with the South in the American Civil War. So how would you guess that cotton workers responded? I guess this statue probably gives you a hint. They organized a campaign of public meetings in support of both the blockade and of the Union because they opposed slavery, seeing it as an assault on free labor. At a mass meeting in Manchester's Free Trade Hall on New Year's Eve, 1862, a mixture of cotton workers and members of Manchester's middle class passed a motion urging Lincoln to prosecute the war vigorously, to fight on, and supporting the blockade, even though it was causing great economic hardship to the merchants and great economic hardship to the workers as well.
President Lincoln responded in a letter to the people of Manchester dated 19th January 1863, and you see the words that are inscribed on his statue. I cannot but regard your decisive utterances on the question as an instance of sublime Christian heroism. By the way, the letter goes on. It is an indeed an energetic and inspiring assurance of the inherent truth of the ultimate and universal triumph of justice, humanity, and freedom. So, happy Martin Luther King's birthday.